afternoon and welcome to the Sunset Safari. We are stalking one of the hardest animals to get on camera. And it's an incredibly beautiful little predator. Oh, there he goes. Oh, no, he's too fast for us. <laughs> it was a little slender mongoose. And I don't think we're going to catch him in those thickets. But anyway, welcome to the Sunset Safari. Uh, my name is Brent Leo Smith, and I have Vim on camera with me. We have a Jamie and Dangerous Dave out on the other vehicle. And we have Louise and Geraldine in final control. So for those of you who went on the Sunrise Safari, we had four male lions right here. Right, judging from the tracks, I would say they've been chased. Unfortunately, I think they've been chased across our eastern, I mean, sorry, our southern boundary, and all these elephant tracks coming through here were definitely, the elephants definitely wouldn't have enjoyed having those lions around. So they were sleeping just over there. And lots of Ellie tracks, which, and lots of impala on the right. So I think those lions have run for all they were worth when they were being chased by those elephants. To see, maybe they didn't go too far, but judging by the rest of the animals around here, I think they have vanished. Let's see if we can find a track of a sprinting lion. Unfortunately, lots of vehicles up and down this road, but I did get the report. There we go, oh, half a lion track with a buffalo track on top of it. Oh, I'm too close, sorry, Vim. So there we go. There. There's a lion running away track. So, unfortunately, those lions have vamoost. But there's still another ex couple of exciting prospects for this sunset safari. Jamie is hot on the heels of Tingana, who went into quite a small area, so we're hoping we catch up with him. And Viam and I have decided we're going to continue to chase that ghost leopard that I managed to see twice on foot, but not on the vehicle. So we've given him a whole day just to calm down, and now it's really hot, so he might not move too much. So let's go see if we can see the mystical running leopard of the north. Welcome to Ergag, who's on their first safari. So it says seatbelt is buckled and we're rearing to go. That we are, hopefully we'll be able to find you some big cats. We've had some spectacular cat sightings over the weekend. Hopefully they continue, continue through the week. Uh, exciting times here. South Carolina wonders how many days can we keep this cat record going for? How many days has it been now? Three, four, I'm not sure. Uh, when did we have Karula? I think that was, what day is it today? It's today, Monday? Today is Monday. So it started on Thursday night with Karula and Shadow. And uh, see, we don't know days of the week out here. It's a bit confusing. Every day it just melts into one. Um, and then on Saturday evening, we had Karula, I think. And Sunday, we had Tingana. And this morning, we had the Inkahumas 
and the Birmingham. So Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. So five days so far. And uh, our record, actually, well, my record was uh, 28 days on the trot with big cats, uh, either lion or leopard, on one of the safaris. So let's see if we can break that. Now I'm probably going to jinx any chances, but we were going for a month that time and we got to 28 days. In those days it was a bit easier with quarantine and Kunuma, not moving too far from quarantine clearings. But I'm feeling the leopard vibes today. So hopefully we will have some success. So uh, apparently the damn camera is upside down and Stoop says, well, this is what Africa really looks like to, our, uh, to us Americans. Well, I hope, hopefully you've managed to write it, Snoop, and uh, hopefully we're not upside down at the moment. And hopefully we're able to show you a bit more of Africa uh, every single day we're on safari. just moving towards that area where we had where I was following that drag mark and we found that male leopard on foot so I think the best way now is to actually find where that kill is uh, we decided not to come out off the drive decided to just let him relax a little bit we don't want to put too much pressure on so we are going to go have a look now and if I still feel he's too, un too unrelaxed if we find him on foot and he runs again then we'll just leave him be uh, for now and hopefully with a bit of time and effort, uh, that male leopard will calm down nicely and we'll be able to have some nice visuals of him. afternoon there's not going to be too much on the move and we're going to try see what we can see before we get there but a lot of your ruminants your kudu uh, and pala and yala are going to be resting in the shade chewing the cud uh, ruminating it's about 34 degrees celsius i think uh, 92 93 odd fahrenheit so quite a warm day days of summer. So, hello to Andrew, Danielle and Alex who are watching for the first time from Canada on their first live safari. So welcome on the back of the vehicle. Hopefully we are going to be able to show you some interesting and fascinating things. And apart from saying hello, you can send Jamie or myself a question about anything you might wonder about the African bush. And uh, I'm sure as you know how to send a message since we've got one. Uh, for those of you who are not sure how to send us a message, uh, or a question, you can do that by emailing us on questions at wildearth.tv or you can use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. So while we go in search of the very, very timid and mysterious jitterish male leopard from the north, uh, Jamie's got some great grey beasts to show you. Good afternoon. Now, in contrast to the leopard that Brent is tracking, 
we have an animal that's not timid, jitterish, or anything along those lines. He just didn't really want to start off with the opening shot that we had in mind at all and decided to move exactly as Brent said you, sent you across to us. But again, and good afternoon and welcome to the Sunset Safari. My name is Jamie. I have Dave on camera with me this afternoon. And at present, we are sitting with a bull elephant on quarantine. Isn't it wonderful? It's almost like we're in a different place completely to see all of this grass growing up to at least knee height compared to a couple of weeks ago when quarantine looked like a veritable desert. So to stop and see this view with an elephant enjoying both the grasses and the perennial herbs and shrubs that are growing up on quarantine clearings is such an amazing experience. I feel, however, as though it should be an experience as viewed from possibly the opposite side of our Ellie. We'll just watch him for a moment as he beats the dust off his next mouthful. And just bear with me one second. Copy that, thanks, Orbs. I'm going to be making my way at some point. Just letting Aubrey know. Aubrey's been checking up on the position of the two Nkuhuma lionesses from this morning that we went tracking down Voyatella main access and just happened to see since there was a head up peeking out from behind a termite mound. So we will be returning to them at some point. Now while I loop around just to get us a nicer view of this lovely elephant ball, who is beautifully relaxed, I just wanted to give you an update for those As we drove up, um, I just caught a glimpse of that leopard. He didn't run off too far. You see him then? He just went behind that thicket. Just stand by. And it's a quite a young male, actually. It's not nearly as big as I originally thought. So he just dashed off there. He was lying out in the shade right here. just going to keep quiet and see if we can catch him. I'm going to pretend to drive away from him. So I'm not driving towards where he was. You got him? There we go. VM spotted him. He's just lying flat in that bush. You think if I go forward, VM, or back? Backwards. going to go forward a little bit. I think he's gone completely flat there. So the fact he didn't run away till I stopped the car is a good sign. Now... I'm just going to pretend to drive away from where he was. Oh dear. So exciting. I've got him, Vim. You got him. So we're just going to stay here quite far away, to the left a little. There we go. There he is. So I'm actually going to just try to sneak forward an inch so you can see his face. But I'm going to stay far away. There we go. So it's very, very important when dealing with unrelaxed animals, and with all animals, in fact, is not to drive straight at them. And I think we're probably going to keep this vehicle to a one-vehicle sighting. And you can see he's already nervous. He's wondering whether we've spotted him. So I'm just going to keep talking normally. And this is one of the best ways to habituate an unrelaxed male leopard. 
And you can see there, he's, he's moving his head, trying to get a reaction from us to see if we've actually spotted him. So I think whatever that kill is must be quite close. I think I might have been checking too far for it this morning. And apparently he's, I'm not sure if, I didn't, he didn't look that big to me. I don't think he was an adult, so he's definitely not the same one that I saw a couple of weeks ago running away from me. He looks a bit younger to me. Just trying to get an idea if we can. Unfortunately, he's a bit low for me to even get any spot patterns. So I don't think this is the male that people call Gajima. I think this is a young dispersal male. He could come from anywhere. He could come from Kruger. He could come, oh, there we go. It's just, we're not gonna follow him. Let's have a look. See, he's not that old. He doesn't have that big a dewlap. Wait, let him turn. So we don't want to put any pressure by going any closer. He is quite a big boy, so, but not as old as someone like Tigana. I'd say he's probably about four or five years old. I'm just going to let him walk away. I'm not going to go follow him any closer. But Viem and I are going to sit here. He seems to be looping back around now, Viem. Might come out into the open again. Have you still got him? There he is. So you can see this is a really huge progress. Uh, he hasn't run away from us. He's stood up and he's walked away from us. So that's a massive, massive bit of progress. And again, it's all how you drive around these animals. And he's obviously come from the area like the Kruger, where there's no cars there. So he hasn't learnt about vehicles yet. So we want to try to keep his interactions with the vehicles as positive as possible. And then hopefully in the not too distant future, he'll become a nice, relaxed male. So I don't want to move the car. Um, I'm just going to because I'm pretty sure he's just gone out of sight and he sat down. So I don't want to move the car. I don't want to spook him at all. So what VM and I are going to do is we're going to stay right here. Uh, we won't stay for too long, but I want to stay for at least five or ten minutes. And we're just going to talk. So you get used to the sound of voices. In the old days, I used to do this with the BBC radio. Uh, just find where a leopard had a kill, leave an empty car with the BBC World Service talking. But we're going to do this ourselves for now. We don't have a BBC radio around, but while we try to habituate this leopard a little bit, but it is exciting to see a new leopard. Um, let's go back to Jamie and those Ellie's. How incredible is this new leopard slowly getting more and more used to having vehicles around? So I've stuck about on quarantine to give Brent the opportunity to spend a little bit of time off air just quietly chatting, getting this leopard more and more used to the presence of vehicles. And what better way to sit and enjoy one's Monday afternoon? It is Monday, right, Dave? It is Monday. It is Monday. Just checking. There is no better way to spend an afternoon <laughs> but to sit and spend some time with an elephant bull on quarantine. He currently looks as though he might actually be resting his head almost on that ruler tree, or oh, not quite. He was thinking about it earlier. Just enjoying the opportunity. You see how his ears are going furiously this afternoon. whose friend Adrian, Adrienne is watching for the first time all the way from New Zealand and isn't quite sure whether or not this show is live. I'd like to offer you a warm welcome to our sunset safari. Been something of a dramatic start this afternoon with a mystery leopard or at least a new character to add to our wonderful cast of animals that come through on a regular basis. We are so fortunate to be in the position that we are in. And Adrian, I really hope that you enjoy the sunset safari with us. I'm hoping at some point to go and track down Tingana 
the big male leopard that we had yesterday afternoon on the sunset safari. His kill was somewhat unfairly stolen by the Birmingham boys sometime last night. And Brent had them looking somewhat not really full. An, uh, an impala between four male lions it doesn't really go all that far, but he did have them on Gauri, Maine this morning. So our southern boundary looking relatively full. I'm not sure whether Brent gave you that update or not, but those lions have since crossed south across our boundary. However, our Unkuhuma lionesses, the two lionesses that we had this morning as well on the Sunrise Safari, are still about and we will be heading to them later depending, of course, on what happens with the drive. Shall we go and get a slightly different view of our elephant so that we don't just have four legs, a tail, and a trunk peeking out from underneath a bush? I think that might be sensible. He is actually slowly contemplating coming to us. You like that, Deb? Oh, yeah. So, Dave, Magical on YouTube would like to know how the name Dangerous Dave came to be. Now, as far as I knew, it was initially Dazzling Dave after the birth, uh, well, after you spotted and then filmed a live zebra foal birth on quarantine. So, Dave, are you dangerous? Um. <laughs> I think that... Yes, Ter <laughs> he is he is most dangerous. Um, was it Brent who started that? I'm pretty, sure it was I'm pretty sure it was Brent who started the nickname Dangerous Dave. Alliteration is a magical thing, unlike this bush that's currently in our way of our view of the elephant. So magical? I'm not sure. I think that Dave still has to has to prove his dangerousness. <laughs> All I can think of now is Danger Mouse, which is not, not where we were going at all with this thought. Yeah, it, was with bread. it did start with bread, apparently. Daring, Daring Dave. What's better? I think Daring Dave is better than Dangerous Dave. Dangerous implies something sort of a bit more. Um, what's the word I want to go with? Dangerous. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, daring, daring could imply lots of, uh, a lot of positive things. Dangerous could imply a lot of negative things. I think we should go with Daring Dave. Daring and Dazzling Dave doesn't work. We need to go, we need to pick one and stick with it. <laughs> Dashing Dave. Oh, poor Dave. <laughs> Is there a synonym for long-suffering that begins with a D? <laughs> considering what we're putting poor Dave yeah. through. <laughs> Dedicated Dave. Dedicated Dave. Putting up with us and our ridiculous shenanigans. Diplomatic Dave. Not saying exactly what it is he thinks about this, this whole conversation. <laughs> I could go on for a while. I'm going to stop now. Okay. Sorry, Dave. No, that's all right. <laughs> it's a lovely shot of the elephant, Dave. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> ah, so Tony, now that we've managed to duck and dive poor old... Um, Dave, let's just go with Dave, uh, Dave's, um, <laughs> Dave's conversation. Tony was saying, is it Amarula season in Africa, essentially, since both Brent and myself apparently don't know what a day it is. Well, to be fair, we never know what day it is. There's not really a, a difference between our Monday, Tuesday, Saturday, or Sunday, or indeed all the days in between. Um, no. Funnily enough, we've just come out of the marula fruiting season. Sorry, to turn this into an actual serious conversation. We have just come out of the marula fruiting season, but what was fascinating about this year is that there were hardly any marula fruit about. And I'm fairly certain it is because of the drought that we experienced such a lack. There were, during the marula fruiting season, so January, February, there were lots of elephant bulls, just like this one, munching about underneath the female marula trees, 
because of course female and male marula trees are different trees and only the females bear fruit. And elephants absolutely love a treat of marula tree fruit. It is sweet, it is juicy, it is high in nutrients and it is high in vitamin C, which even led to this rumor that elephants in must would specifically target marula fruit over any other food source. That's not really true. It's more to do with the fact that quite simply, they were looking for the high sugar and high nutrient content that those fruits provide. But Tony, unfortunately, we have come to the end of our marula fruiting season. A marula being the liqueur, a creamy liqueur that is brewed from the fruits of amarula. We've passed that season for now, but it is a very, very popular drink in this particular area. Now, I'm sure you're wondering how Brent's leopard search is going. Let's have a quick look at the kill that he made. So guys, we found the kill and it's a baby, baby kudu. So we're not gonna hang around now. We'll probably try again a little bit later in the evening but uh, we'll stop a bit further away. We now at least know where the kill is. So it was just where he was lying and he has fed off it partially. He did look very well fed. So really exciting stuff. And this gives us a really good chance to habituate this animal. So we're gonna leave here quietly quickly and let's go back to Jamie. Just a quick little peek on what's happening on that side of things. In the meantime, we are still with our lovely bull elephant who has been so patient in listening to our somewhat absurd discussion of poor Dave's name. Very, very tolerant. Hmm? Very tolerant. Very tolerant. Very, very tolerant. Oh, there he is. I knew I saw another elephant. I was wondering when he'd make an appearance. I'm going to go forward a little bit to show you what I mean. Since there is another young bull making his way onto quarantine. And I see where he's disappeared off to. He's gone to go and have a mud bath. There he's hiding behind the jackalberry tree that you can see on your screen. That, by the way, is the jackalberry tree that Karula had her kill in a couple of weeks ago. Here he comes, coming back to join his friend in snacking on the grasses of quarantine. Look at all the mud all over him. I wonder, I'm trying to work out where he's been to. He's come from the western edge of quarantine. Perhaps he was having a bath in the Juma Dam. I wonder that he didn't find some water still in the shade, in the protected areas of that drainage line. There is still groundwater about. I just thought I'd memorized most of the muddy puddles where the animals could go to wallow or to drink. But he's been using his trunk to throw mud all over his back and his sides, which on a blisteringly hot, really blisteringly hot day, considering it is autumn, in the Sabi sands. It's a great way for an elephant to cool down. Let's try and get a clearer view. So these two young bulls, it's relatively common to see them together like this. When you are young and kicked out of your herd for the first time in your life, you've had the prediction, protection of a family group the entire time and now all of a sudden it's time to make it on your own in the great outdoors. Having a buddy of a similar age is a great way to go about things. And hello Ivan. Ivan is watching all the way in Serbia and was wondering a little bit about the end of an elephant's tail and was wondering if that is hair. Yes, Ivan, that is hair at the end of an elephant's tail. 
They can use it as a very effective fly swat, as well as possibly even swishing about to communicate their mood to different individual or other individuals. What's up, boy? He <laughs> just gave a really deep sigh. So, Ivan, believe it or not, elephants are covered in hair in certain places. Oh, time for a head scratch. Resting his weight against the tree. So, elephants have hair all around their lips, around their eyelashes, even on their legs, even though you can't see it that clearly. Just bear with me one moment. Somebody's trying to call me. Standing by. Oh, sorry, it was on Sandy Patch, very close to the fire break, just south of the fire break junction. Just updating Aubrey about the leopard tracks that I saw this morning. So, Ivan, like all mammals, an elephant is a hairy animal. It might not be as clear as it is on something like a leopard or a lion, but they have hair inside their ears, they have hair on their lower lips, and when you touch their skin, every now and again you encounter a really thick, really bristly hair. None of the mammals go without it. It's been really, really obliging. So I'm just gonna shift backwards a fraction as he comes to join us. You can see how beautifully relaxed he is. Such an obliging young boy. Ears flapping, tail moving from side to side. Everything here is just communicating that he is quite happily ignoring us. But looking at him from this angle, and Ivan, if you look really closely, you'll see the eyelashes around his eye, catching the glint of the sun. Yes, you are so beautiful, boy. See where the mud has caked all around his eyelashes as well as his ears. And as he flaps his ears like this, you so it's so clearly an effective cooling mechanism because you can actually see the blood vessels protruding from the skin. Just like if you squeeze your arm, you can see the veins protruding. Guys, give me one more second. Go ahead, Andrew. Absolutely, you're more than welcome. Sorry, guys, there is another vehicle that is coming to join us. Now, we have another Brent. Brent, not the guide Brent, but a new viewer Brent who would like to know something about the temperature this afternoon. Now, Brent, I can't remember the exact temperature, but apparently it is three degrees in Ontario, Canada, and here it must be, sure, 35, 34, 35, so well into the 90s, 90s Fahrenheit. Very, very hot. So that is 93 Fahrenheit, 34 degrees in centigrade. So definitely a very warm afternoon that we are enjoying, considering that we've been talking about winter approaching and how chilly it is in the mornings. Still these hot, hot afternoons. And this damage to this tree has already been done by an elephant. Hello, boy. Can I come join you this side? Hmm? I 
Otherwise, you're hiding behind this branch. I'll come join you here. Okay, boy. All right. See? Yeah. All right, boy. It's okay. It's all right. All right. Here you go. Yes, you are so beautiful. So I'm talking to him now, just to convey intention rather than meaning or words. So the words that I'm saying are completely meaningless to him, but the tone is not. So a very gentle, very calm, very low pitched tone is a way of my saying to him that I don't mean him any harm, any threat, and that he needn't be worried about our presence next to him. And you'll always find that elephants are more relaxed when they have come to you rather than you approaching him. In this case, he's still perfectly calm. Hello, boy. Yes, you're going to come say hi at some point. And he is making short work of what looks like devil thorns off quarantine clearings. And Kai, who is one of our newer viewers, Kai was wondering how much does an elephant need to eat in terms of grass and leaves on a day-to-day -day basis. And Kai, an elephant bull like this, and it is a young male, would probably need somewhere in the region between 560 odd to 600 odd pounds of food, and that's just in one day. Most of that, however, is excrete, or a third of that at least, is excreted as waste product, so they have a very inefficient digestive system. And that's also one of the reasons why they are so water dependent because their digestive processes need a great deal of water in order to digest the plant material that they do consume. But he is loving this new green blanket that has come across over quarantine in the last 10 days. It's like being in a different place completely. Look at him as he beats each piece that he grabs on the ground and on his legs as a way of ridding it of the dust and the dirt. Again, hello to... <laughs> that doesn't look very appetizing, boy. <laughs> Breaking down what's left of this poor sickle bush tree that's already been thoroughly consumed by elephants and has only just started coppicing now. I'm just going to be quiet for one second. Sorry, Errol, I was about to answer your question, but I can actually hear him chewing. his ears flapping against his side. Such an amazing sound. Okay. Just enjoying this moment while he's nice and close to us. Errol, you were wondering, and Errol's already been welcomed by Brent, but let me extend my welcome as well to Errol watching our show for the first time. You were wondering, considering how thick an elephant's skin is, would they be plagued by ticks? 
And the answer is yes, elephants do get ticks. Not as much as, say, a buffalo might do. Their skin is very, very thick. But you can see how thin, I mean, every time he flaps his ears, just watch how thin the skin is around there. You can see already where the infection has eaten away little pieces of that delicate skin. So there are patches, just like that, where the skin is thinner than others. So around his inner ear, maybe even the folds of his neck, possibly around his eye, and then most especially towards the backside area and between his back legs. Oh. <laughs> what are you after there, boy? Doesn't sound very appetizing. Although they won't carry the same amount in the way of ox peckers that a buffalo would, they do still have them. The reason we don't get ox peckers, the bird that sits on them, and yes, I mean, they don't carry as many ticks, so it's not as worth the ox peckers while, but mostly the absence of ox peckers is due to the fact that elephants just don't tolerate them. They cannot, it's the same reason why lions don't. They cannot stand the feeling of ox peckers landing and crawling all over them in the same way that buffalo are allow or giraffe or impala. They just really, really don't like that feeling. And so every time an ox pecker tries to land on them, they swat it away. second elephant standing at the back and our gentleman oh is he determined to return to the sickle bush it seems as though he is sickle bush of course having tremendously long thorns and incredibly dis uncomfortable thorns if you ever find yourself standing on them but they are no match for an elephant and as he crunches away on his afternoon meal Annie you were wondering, oh, sorry, managed to almost fall. How do you always fall over when you're sitting up? That's quite impressive. But Annie was wondering whether or not anybody knows if an elephant's digestive system has got more or less effective over the time that they have evolved. And to be quite honest, I have absolutely no idea. Elephants have evolved from a couple that the evolution pathway has taken them a number of different ways and they've gone from very very large in terms of the woolly mammoth to very very small in terms of some very almost pygmy like elephant formations that they, within their evolutionary history the ancestors of our common savannah elephant have actually adopted whether or not their digestive systems were more efficient or less so, my guess, if we had to look at the woolly mammoth, somehow I feel as though its digestive system would have been probably more efficient than the African elephant or the African savannah elephant. And I'm saying that just because in general, animals from colder climates tend to be able to pack on more body fat when they need to. But really, that is entirely a guess. I honestly have no idea if their digestive systems have evolved and become more efficient or less so. The only thing I can tell you is that their digestive systems have evolved alongside the ecosystem that we're currently in and the way that the trees are balanced and the grasses are balanced. So the amount of food that they need to eat is a way of balancing the trees and the grasses out here if that makes any sense. Uh, whether or not that has to do with the efficiency of their digestive system, I honestly have no idea. So Kai, you were wondering, apart from the oxpecker conversation that we had, what is the number one animal that an elephant does not get along with? 
And Kai, elephants can be wonderfully, endearingly grumpy when they choose to be. In particular, they really seem to have it in for wild dogs. We've had a couple of incredible sightings of elephants going out of their way to chase a pack of wild dogs. The difference here, of course, being that elephants will also go out of their way to chase lions and leopards. But lions will keep running, leopards will keep running away from the elephants. Wild dogs will scamper about their feet. And it's up to you whether or not you believe that they are having fun whilst doing so. Personally, I believe that they do have fun teasing elephants. I think they have a ball of a time proving their agility to these enormous giants in their eyes. So wild dogs definitely seem to rub elephants off the wrong way. And it is interesting because a wild dog is not a threat to an elephant. At the current evolutionary size, wild dogs and elephants are not the interact or do not have any kind of interaction on a predator prey scale. And yet there's something about the smell, there's something about the movement of a wild dog that drives elephants mad. That being said, you know the old rumor about elephants being afraid of mice? I have seen elephant, full grown elephant, run away from mice before. I promise you, I'm not joking. I've seen a mouse run across close to an elephant and I've seen it freak out and run away. So it's the, part of the reason is because they've got a blind spot. And I mean, when we, when we have it, when we next have a look at him, just look at where his nose falls and underneath his tusk. And you can see it's just impossible for him to see by his feet. Hello, boy. So something small skittering about there definitely has the ability to unsettle an elephant. Hello, beautiful. You are being so beautifully obliging, thank you. His trunk is covered in hair as well. Ah, uh ah, -uh. hello, boy. Ah, uh ah, -uh ah. -uh. Come now, don't touch. No, don't touch. All right, thank you. Thank you, boy. There was nothing serious there. He actually, do you know, funnily enough, he actually almost forgot that we were here. He was coming because he smelt something nice underneath the front of the car that he wanted. Usually when an elephant approaches like that, when they want to come up and investigate your car, they've got a very specific body posture. And you'll notice there I didn't raise my tone and I didn't tap the side of the car, I didn't do anything to try and, as I have had to do in the past with elephants that want to come up and touch the car, at no point did I actually feel that was happening with this elephant. All I did was put two fingers on the side of the door, probably so softly that you couldn't hear it. That was all that we had to do. And just change my tone by a nuance. And that was all that was needed to just say to him that he was a little bit in my body space. And even then, I wasn't terribly concerned about it. It was just more a reminder that I was here because I think he got so involved in this current feeding state of mind that he's in that he kind of sort of forgot there that we were here. It does happen. I've had it happen with fighting elephants before, or young sparring elephants, I should say, where they've completely forgotten that I was here and I had to tap the side of the car just because the one that was losing kept backing into me. But he was of no threat at all there. It was just a very gentle, all I was doing was giving him a very gentle reminder that I was still here. And look at his body language. He hasn't looked at me once since we did that. Yes, boy. Did you forget we were here for a second? Yes, you gorgeous. Now, I said he forgot that we were here. I don't, I, I think that was maybe a bad explanation. I, elephants are smart enough that that doesn't really happen. He just got so absent-minded and comfortable with us here that he just kind of wandered across to us. And with it, he brought this incredible smell of elephant. It's almost like a horsey smell, grassy and fresh and very big animal. And. Tony was wondering a little bit, since 
we're discussing having an elephant close and what sort of signs or how I would react differently. Here is boy. Is that, was that a particularly nice, nice mouthful? <laughs> he, he just gave me this very lazy sort of half-lidded glance. I just realized there's another male coming up behind me. And I was talking about the smell. And I just wanted to have a good sniff of this individual because these two are perfectly, beautifully calm. And I wanted to just make sure that this elephant that was coming up behind me was not the one that's been currently in must and has been pursuing vehicles for no clear or apparent reason recently. And it's maybe just a bit of a temper tantrum with his must cycle. So Tony, you were wondering about what the signs are of must. Let me just talk about what it is first. It's an, a period in a male elephant's life and they go through it at different times. So the younger elephants will go through it for shorter periods, but more frequently. The older elephants will go through it for a longer period, but less frequently. And essentially what it is, is it's a raised testosterone level within the elephant itself that makes it, first of all, more likely to go and seek out a female in estrus with, which, or with whom to mate with. And then at this... Sorry, just listening to the... Aubrey, he's, he's also tracking, or he's been trying to track a Tingana. So I was just listening to his update. He's been tracking Triple M. Oh, it sounds as though Brent's following up on that particular elephant. Okay. Um, right, so back to the must cycle of elephant Tony. When they start to stream from their temporal glands, as well as so they get what's known as a must walk. It's a very arrogant, almost swagger-like posture that they do with their ears above, and this is one of the best signs, or best ways of reading it, particularly if an elephant's been rolling in mud, so you can't see the secretions from their temporal glands. When the level of their ears falls higher than their shoulders, let's just look sort of at what I mean. This is a very relaxed, non-must elephant. And although when he leans down, when he rests down, his ears change position, the sort of the top part of his ear that connects to his skull, the joint where it connects, that curve connects to the top part of his head, is below his shoulder. In a must ball, it's held very, very high. The muscles are almost in a constant state of contraction, holding that ear above the shoulder height. And then in the absolute height of must, it will be they will start to dribble or secrete a very strong smelling urine almost constantly and very often they are clearly visible as a male elephant so essentially they are have an erection for a good a great deal of the time that they are in must and those are the sort of signs that you look out for the secretion of urine is the most prominent and that's when you know that they are absolutely in the height of must and you'll smell it it's a very very different scent from the typical elephant bull smell so in young males it only lasts maybe a week to three weeks but it happens a couple of times a year in older bulls 30 years and older it will last for up to a month maybe even a month and a half too but it'll happen about once a year or twice a year, depending on the age of that particular elephant. Uh, that is the way in which must cycles work. Now, it's interesting. I mean, we're sitting... It's not the best view, but we've been discussing this ball with the cut in his ear. He seems to have moved off for now. But what he very kindly did was break down a fence three nights in a row. Dave, I'm not sure if we can maybe just have a look at it. It's very far away. Uh, Leftish. There we go. You guys can sort of see. I know it's far, but you can sort of see what happened to that particular fence when it decided to tangle with an elephant. <laughs> that was the third night in a row, at which point the elephant decided to make the damage pretty much unfixable without replacing the fence itself. Oh, here we go. Another young bull. Hello, boy. Where did you sneak up from, hmm? You've also been bathing in mud. There must be a mud wallow down there that I didn't know about.
a magical speaking going back to the subject of animals that have been known to bother elephants magical was just saying that our wild dog sighting with the elephants was absolutely incredible we've had a few of them and there's nothing like watching a sighting like that oh, i love the way they rock on oh, they rest one leg against the other it's so special so we've had a few and it's so interesting to try and observe a wild dog sighting and talk about it and try and dodge the elephant's misplaced, not anger, but just misplaced upset when they're trying to decide which way they're going to go, but completely agreed that they are, those sorts of sightings are incredible. But to an, a creature even smaller than a wild dog, Janie has been watching documentaries about elephants, African elephants and bees and was wondering a little bit about, sorry, I'm just turning down my game drive comms. She was just wondering whether or not this is the case. She's been watching documentaries on it. And the fact that, that it might be because they are scared of them getting up their nose. Oh, there's that lovely elephant bull. He is so far at the back. Can you see him from your perspective, Dave? This is a bull that's come in from Kruger. Can you see his flopped ear? I've seen him once or twice while I've been driving about, but he's so skittish that I haven't managed to get him on camera. He's not skittish, skittish. He's just sort of, he's not like the, the other elephants that move about this area. He just likes to move away constantly. I think Brent might have put him on camera. I don't know, Dave, if you've been with Brent when he has. I've definitely seen him fairly regularly. I love that flopped and bent cartilage. Sorry, Janie, I know I was in the middle of answering your question, but that might be the only view that we get of this gentleman unless he decides to approach us. So, Janie, back to the elephants and the bees. Is it true? Yes, it is true. It is absolutely the case that elephants do not like bees. Funnily enough, Janie, this was something that I learned from a couple of the viewers when I first started working here. Because to be honest, I had no idea. I had a rough idea that elephants were uncomfortable with bees. But quite a few viewers sent me a few articles about the use of beehives to try and mitigate the conflict between elephants and farmers in agricultural areas. And it seems as though having beehives around crops really does act to deter elephants. And it might be a combination of the noise plus, Janie, I'm not sure if it's just the idea of being stung in the trunk. I think that there's probably more to it than that. I think quite possibly the noise plays a role in elephants' fears of bees. Either way, yes, it is true. Elephants dislike bees. <sighs> yes, boy. All right, nicely now. Little bit of a heel rock. Such a stunning shot, look at this. Standing by. Okay, copy. Brent's just letting me know that he's going to go track the last tracks that I found for Tingana this morning. Now, what does our elephant have on his head? Is it a cobweb? What have you got there, boy? got this little streak of white and I can't decide if it's bird no it's not bird poo it's three-dimensional if that makes sense it's a piece of ah now that shows just how thick an elephant's skin really is that's a thorn branch with a thorn digging into his head that he has just kind of brushed through and brushed past without even noticing it. Look at this view. Look at the wrinkles. 
and the mud caked around his ear. There you can see where he's moved through the thorn bushes. You can see all of the scratches, of those pale lines along his ear, for example. There as he flaps it, you can see where the trees have scratched up against him. All the while producing the gentle, or at least the gentle smell of elephant digestive gases wafting over us in the loveliest possible way. Oh, blowing, clearing your trunk. <laughs> that was basically a sneeze. It wasn't quite a sneeze. It wasn't as involuntary as that. He was deliberately blowing out of his trunk to rid it of dirt. He's such a special boy, this one. He's just been so wonderfully relaxed. I'm really enjoying my time with him. Jeffrey, and who is watching all the way in Texas. Hello, Jeffrey. Welcome to our sunset safari. So Jeffrey was wondering about the nerve endings within an elephant's trunk, essentially asking, do they have them inside of their trunks? And if so, how far up the trunk can an elephant feel? So Jeffrey, they have nerve endings all the way up their trunk, right up into their sinuses, just in the same way that we do. The difference is the combination of, for example, nerve cells of, of pressures, pressure versus nerve cells of pain versus the nerve cells that sense or the sensory cells that sense temperature changes. And for the life of me, Jeffrey, I cannot remember the distinction between the different nerve cells. But for example, the tip of this elephant's trunk will have plenty of touch receptors, so pressure, probably a little bit of sensitivity, maybe temperature control that will then continue up towards the trunk, but they need more or a higher concentration around the tip than they do further up the nasal passages. Now, if you've ever seen a, an elephant's skull, they have tremendously large sinuses. <laughs> that was interesting. He very clearly just kicked that younger bull off that tree without even really needing to be terribly aggressive about it. He just kind of strolled. And those are two almost fully grown, or what were fully grown marulas that have been pushed over, snapped, chewed on, coppiced, and are now being munched on once again. So trees of true survival from an elephant's perspective. So Jeffrey, in terms of feeling, yes, an elephant can feel just like when you accidentally choke on something and you get water coming out of your nose or you accidentally go get rolled over by a wave in the sea and you breathe in the salt water and that burning sensation that you get at the back of your nose or your throat, elephants have that same capacity. It's slightly different from us because, of course, an elephant can stick its nose into water, pull that water up, and then stick it into their mouths without experiencing any undue discomfort. But they do have to have some form of sensory cells within their nasal passages themselves. So the highest concentration will be at the prehensile tips, because it's those tips that do most of the work, but they will still have feeling and touch all the way up their noses, or all the way up their trunks. The other day I stopped for a couple of elephants that were making quite a noise around the Juma Dam. And there was one female with a snared trunk. And her trunk snare had, it was not our, it's not the usual female that we see, the one with the notch in her left ear and the sort of about a third of her trunk missing. This elephant had about half of her trunk missing. And she was snoring and snorting away still surviving perfectly happily, but it was very sad to see. Now we've been seeing lots of little bulls in this area. And 
I'm not sure why. I'm not sure why we're so seeing so many young bulls. Perhaps they just came together all as a bachelor herd group, or perhaps they were attracted by the presence of the breeding herds. And we have seen quite a few breeding herds over the last few days. And Ellen in Arkansas, apparently you were watching at one point where a bull came rampaging into a breeding herd. And this, presume, I'm not sure exactly when this was, but the bull came rampaging in and eventually with much commotion mounted a young female and mated with her. And you were wondering if this is normal behavior within a group. Well, the fascinating thing about that is that elephant behavior or elephant mating behavior can be an incredibly communal activity. First of all, the female displays what is known as an estrus walk. Tail up, head up, it's almost like a bull's must walk. And it's essentially her advertising to anyone in the vicinity that she's ready to mate. But if she is a particularly, particularly with young cows, that whole experience is still relatively traumatic for them because they have no idea what's going on. Now, elephant bull suitors are very persistent. And it's the female's, not job, but instinct to reject his advances for as long as possible in order to ensure that he is the best gentleman. Sorry, we better have a look at him if he keeps doing that. Reaching up into the marula tree. So it's, it's her job to avoid him, to make sure that no other better male is going to come along. Oh, come on, boy, you were reaching up your trunk so nicely. One more time, you missed a spot. You missed a branch up there. Sorry, Ellen, I'm just having a quick sip of water. It is a very warm afternoon. So, Ellen, it is normal mating behavior. And she, as I said, she will reject him and he gets more vocal and desperate as she continues to do so. So elephant mating is very much a herd affair. And it does take it does seem traumatic to the human eye and for females for young females it can be quite traumatic because the male is that much heavier than she is a young elephant cow could weigh that is sexually mature could weigh as little as two and a half tons and she could end up mating with a male that is twice if not more so that weight and she's got to bear all of that weight on her pelvis it's one of the reasons why Elephants have prehensile penises, is to make sure that that entire experience is as short as possible so that she doesn't have to bear more weight than she has to for too long. And it is an interesting thing, that whole mating experience. Typically a female will mate, she will fall pregnant, she will be pregnant for 22 months and she will continue to suckle the youngster for at least a year, if not more than that, usually about two years. So generally four years between estrus cycles. Now, I have been to areas where they implement contraceptive programs, which are necessary in closed systems, so not where we are at the moment. Obviously we've got a nice open patch of ground where the elephants can control their own population. But in closed systems, where a number or too many elephants can do damage to the other animals and to the ecosystems. I have been in places where they've contracepted the elephants. And all that it's, this particular contraceptive method has done, because it is autoimmune, it's immunocontraception, it's not hormonal contraception, the elephant still cycles as normal. So she still goes into estrus as normally as she might usually. It's fertilization that is prevented from happening. And in that, in that situation where the female isn't having a baby, she then goes into estrus far more regularly than once every four years. So one of the strongest arguments that was put forward, and I'm not saying I agree with it, one of the strongest arguments that was put forward against that contraceptive type was actually that it was going to cause increased harassment by male elephants, and that that in turn was going to do severe damage to the herd dynamics. Funnily enough, from what research has been conducted over the last 25 years, that has not been the case at all. And the level of interaction between bulls and cows has been completely within the bounds of what would be, what would be described as normal. Nevertheless, you can understand those concerns when you experience a sighting like that where 
it seems so traumatic to the rest of the herd itself. And of course, male animals, when they do have access to a female, can be incredibly possessive over that female. And they will attempt to try and defend her from even her previous year's offspring. Whether, and that's not just, doesn't it just apply to elephants? It can apply to rhino, it can apply to buffalo, it can even apply to lions. They can get quite aggressive with anybody that they, or any animal that they perceive as standing in their way. Still normal though, Ellen, in that particular situation. You are one of our newer viewers and watching the way that the elephant trunk is curling around the grass and the leaves and just saying how amazing that is and how cool it is, that level of coordination. Such a beautiful sighting and peaceful sighting that we've been enjoying this afternoon. And Shia, that elephant trunk is the most extraordinary instrument out of any in the animal kingdom capable of pushing down enormous trees, pulling down an enormous branch, and yet at the same time, capable of stroking another elephant, of picking up the finest blade of grass. Elephants can pick up a toothpick off the ground. That is how coordinated their trunks are. I love his little leaf in the middle of his forehead, by the way. It's too sweet. <laughs> as coordinated as, as they are, sometimes you, they have to end up with something of a foliage decoration. I know the feeling, boy. I'm the same when I eat a meal that I really enjoy. But yes, those trunks, exceptionally coordinated with a prehensile tip capable of the, and elephants have this brain that is devoted towards proprioception and their dimension of the three-dimensional world around them. So their trunks are the most incredible things. Now, we have really, truly enjoyed this elephant sighting for the last hour. It's been incredibly special. I think it might be time for us to move on, maybe go and see what those lions are up to. In the meantime, let's see how Brent has got on with tracking his leopard. So, uh, we've come to give Aubrey a hand looking for Tengana, a slightly more relaxed leopard than the other one we saw. We haven't given up on him, don't you worry. We're just giving him a little bit of space. Now that we know where the killers, we can make a much more educated approach. But uh, Aubrey and I went for a little walk in here, and uh, we had to give up on our Tengana search on foot in here. And there's quite a lot of elephants in there. A big breeding herd, so we didn't want to push our luck. So it's a strong possibility he might come out a bit later, but Aubrey and Ephraim are still in the area having a look. So I'm going to move off and start slowly meandering my way back towards where that unrelaxed male is. Unrelaxed male sounds like such a terrible name. But for now, so we can Maybe we can verify them against other pictures that yours has taken in Buffalo's hook. But for now, we'll just call him the unknown. I think it's better than the unrelaxed, the unknown. Maurice would like to know, is that the leopard I spotted a few weeks ago? Uh, it wasn't. The one I saw a few weeks ago was uh, an adult male, so a bit bigger than this guy. Uh, this guy's a young adult, I mean, maybe as old as five. I would guess probably closer to four. But, oof. Uh, difficult to say, we didn't really get the best view. So what our plan is now, we're gonna slowly meander there and we're gonna approach from the northern side this time so we can see from quite a long way away. We came from the southern side on our way there and we sort of got surprised because as we came around the corner, he was right there. So from the northern side, we can approach. We know where the carcass is so we can stop 
at a, probably about 70, 80 meters away. And, and hopefully he would have moved back towards the carcass. Otherwise, we'll just wait patiently for a little bit. Hello, boys and girls. Now, careful, we think Tingana's around here, and he likes your lot. Go. Off he goes. Nice and pile of mail. Oh, there we go. Snorting at the ladies, just for good measure. So you will find quite a few male impala fall victim to leopards at this time of the year due to their complete fixation on mating. They actually visibly lose condition while they are mating or actually more in the preparation to mating, chasing ladies up and down, trying to keep other males out. Very busy job trying to keep all the girls in check. Now, he seems to have himself quite a nice little group of ladies here. And if we meander a little bit further down the road, I think that's where the guys who don't have any girlfriends just yet are. So not too far away from his precious resource of ladies. We should find a little bachelor group. That constant snorting is also probably to remind these guys, there we go, all the boys. But he's still keeping his eye out. Hey boys. Well, he's a bit too young to challenge this year, but he's not. So these guys will hang on the peripheries, not too far away from the breeding groups, and if there is even a sniffer of a chance, they'll be in there. Now, referring to this unknown leopard that we had a nice little brief glimpse of on the Sunset Safari, uh, Tommy's wondering, how did he come to be here? Is he going to try and make his home here? Will the other leopards chase him away? Well, Tommy, he's, a, he's probably, if he's the age I think he is, I need to have a better look to be 100% sure. Uh, he's a dispersal male, so he's been pushed from his... Uh, natal territory probably by his father and by his mother to a degree and he's been wondering and the young male leopards do this they'll move through multiple territories before they're big enough and strong enough to start challenging for an area and he is if he's closer to five than four then he is getting to that stage where he will start challenging for an area and uh, one thing is he might be the one thing he is a very great threat to at the moment is uh, any cubs around. Now, those young dispersal male leopards like that uh, are big threats to leopard cubs. Just judging from his behavior, he definitely hasn't come from the south, south of us, which is all wasabi sands. So most of those leopards are, are very used to cars. So that leaves us, he's either come from the, the north, northwest or the north or the east. So he's come from this belt here. So he's either come from the Manieleti or he's come from Kruger. And both southern Manuleti and this western section of Kruger is an area that is not too often traversed by vehicles, which would explain his shyness at the moment. But very, very interesting to actually see a new leopard. And it is, it is, a, it is a little bit wonderful. Uh, to see a leopard that's not a proper Sabi Sands leopard that just goes next to the car. Uh, it reminds you that it is really wild out here 
and the animals can move and we've got this animal that's moved from an area that's not used to people and now he's here and will he stay here I don't know uh, but it is exciting nonetheless. Christopher, who is in Arizona. Uh, Christopher would like to know, where would I like to take a live game drive if I could take one anywhere in the world? It, of course, apart from Juma. Well, Christopher, that's an excellent question. Um, I think, for me personally, it would probably have to be in Africa. It would be oh, the northern Chobe complex up that part of the world. And incredible, incredible predator interaction, incredible predator density in that area. And outside of Africa, that is a very difficult one. Um, it would either be India or, or Brazil. I think Brazil might win for the Pantanal, uh, for the jaguars, the weird anteaters and all that, and as, uh, I don't know, and the birds, of course. So I think in Africa would be northern Botswana. And in outside of Africa, the Pantanal in Brazil. Just see his horns budding through. Now, VM and I, we don't trust in Yala's too much. Is he looking at you funny, VM? Well, let's just be thankful it wasn't one of those guys who jumped into the car with us. The Nyala often move out onto slightly more open areas in the late afternoon for a bout of feeding before returning to the safety of the thickets in, uh, as it goes towards darkness. And there are those wonderful eddies you've just been with with Jamie, so I'm not going to stay with them. I'll keep going past. Sorry about that, just catching up with the Game Drive channel, seeing what's happening. There's uh, going to be a gorgeous, gorgeous evening. And I've just heard Jamie's just come across a big breeding herd of Ellie, so let's go have a look. is indeed the most gorgeous evening. And at the moment, I'm really enjoying these long distance shots of elephants moving across to water. They've just arrived at the Jumid Pan, and I wanted to just give you this overall view of them. Oh, <laughs> there's a buffalo who is not terribly chuffed with his company at the waterhole. <laughs> Look at the elephant on the left there. He is ooh, not so certain, not so impressed. But yes, there's a whole herd of elephants approaching this waterhole. We can go a little bit closer now that we've just had this incredible view in the afternoon light. I've been distracted from heading across to the lions. It's just too beautiful. Look at those elephants walking across on the other side of the dam wall. Here we go. 
the wandering through the patchy sunlight is so beautiful. All right, let's head a little bit closer. Go and join them as they have their afternoon drink. <laughs> I wonder if Fred wants to try and... <laughs> I was wondering if Brent was going to come and try and steal the elephant sighting as well as the leopard, but it didn't work out so well. <laughs> he did manage to spray us with water, much like an elephant sprays its trunk <laughs> as he drove past. Let's move across to the dam. This is so special. An afternoon filled with elephants, and to be completely honest, I can't think of a better way of spending an afternoon. Yes, we will definitely go to the lines. I've just been waiting for some of the other vehicles to move through that particular sighting, as well as for the afternoon to get a little bit cooler so that we can go and enjoy the sighting when they might decide to get up and move about. Hello, guys. No, no, you naughty bull. Oh, look at the chaos he's causing. He just waltzed in there and pushed everybody out of the way. A young elephant bull reaching across to sniff this one. Sniffing around the temporal glands and also sticking his trunk into the other elephant's mouth. We might even see him put his trunk, the elephant on the right, we might even see him put his trunk into his own mouth. So elephants can't phlegm and grimace. And the way that they approach that is to put the tip of their trunk against where the organ of Jacobson sits at the roof of the mouth. You didn't, you didn't need to have the whole pan to yourself, mister. You've now chased all of them away, except for this youngster on the right. And we'll move to enjoy the grasses that are currently growing on this clearing. Lots of little ones in this herd, at least four or five. Another really beautiful sighting. I encountered a couple of days, was it yesterday morning, on the sunrise safari that we had those Ellie's day at Bottles Hook, or was it the day before? Yeah, the day before. Day before. Either way, recently I saw the biggest elephant cow I have ever seen in my entire life. She was absolutely huge. She moved across in front of us, and I was just so overwhelmed by the sheer size of her bulk as she moved next to the vehicle. I was stunned speechless. The most beautifully peaceful female. She had no signs of stress, nothing that was upsetting her at all. And this little naughty youngster, at the back there, Are you up to nothing? No good, little one. No, just been having a bath. Covered in mud and water. And such a different dynamic between the solitary bulls that we were watching earlier, even though they were together as a herd, or at least together as a group, and now compared to this breeding herd where the bonds between each little individual herd member is so important. Moms and aunts and sisters. Let's just have a look and see. This young male here might think about chasing the buffalo again. He's got that sort of posture about him. It's also a young male. 
the perfect age to start thinking about pushing his weight around. Oh, no, more intimidated by the other females in the herd than he is concerned about chasing a buffalo. Oh, that's a beautiful sight. And then Sean, who is watching in Canada, you were just saying that you are loving our show. And it is wonderful to have you on board with us. We were talking a little bit about bees earlier. You were wondering if we have African bees or Africanized bees in this area. The answer is yes, we do. The African, in inverted commas, killer bee, which uh, the name has since been changed to just the African honey bee, but it is, has been previously known as the African killer bee, does occur naturally in this area, as do multiple other species of bee, including the Mopani bee, which is crucial in pollinating a lot of the different flowers out here. Hello, little one. You stick close to mom there. Oh. Saying hello to an older cousin. Here we go, trunk in mouth. It's the best. Oh. <laughs> It's the best place to really get a good sniff of your companion, sticking a trunk in the mouth. Hello, young boy. Look at that dust flying, green grass. Hello, boy. And now, are you going to come and be terribly, oh, oh thinking about it? <laughs> Not quite brave enough. So, Kathy, watching our elephants snack away, you were wondering whether or not. Look, the elephant's going to chase the hardy dog. No, no, where you were exactly, Dave. <laughs> thinking about it. It is out of approach at the hardy dog. Brings us back to what we were saying about elephants and mice. Mm. Changed her mind. She definitely thought about it, and she's still not quite certain how she feels about the hardy dog. <laughs> the little bird. Sorry, Kathy. You were asking about whether or not elephants ever eat mushrooms. I've very seldom seen them go for mushrooms. I have seen them put the odd mushroom in their mouth and then spit it out again. So I haven't seen them munching all that often. I'm sure that there are types of mushroom, though, that are edible to elephants. I just haven't observed the practice myself, just in the same way that there are different types of mushroom that we can eat as opposed to the ones that are toxic to us. Kathy, I've been really interested in fungus over the last few days since the rain has occurred and since I've been double checking up all the different species that we get. Hello. Ah, uh, Dave, let's have a look at this elephant ball at the back here. Yeah? Is this our gentleman friend? No, it's not. I think it's just a ball coming for a drink. As wonderful as the sighting is, I think it is time for us to take our leave. We want to get to the lions before they start to get up and move about. So I'm going to leave our elephants for now. In the meantime, let us find out what Brent is up to. So we're nearly back where we last saw that unrelaxed male leopard. Well, VM and I have been calling him the ghost, which for now, 
Oh, Spookle. The ghost. I quite like that. What do you think, Fim? I like it. You like it? Fim likes the ghost as well. So, we're going to get up junction with um, the northern, north and eastern boundaries. I'm going to put the car into low range. I'm going to go really, really slowly. I'm not going to be quiet. I want him to get used to the sound of people's voices. And we've already had one win today, the fact that he didn't disappear off at high speed. He just rather he walked off. So I'm hoping that if we stay a little bit further away this time, and we know where the carcass is, he might continue to feed. Even if it is a little bit sneakily and hiding a little bit, it'll still be worthwhile just spending some time with him teaching him that we're not out to get him, we're not a threat. Crystal in California it says, Have, has he hoisted his kill? And not when we were last there, Crystal. So unfortunately, we won't be able to stay after dark, but just spot on correct. A lot of leopards that aren't relaxed during the day are far more relaxed at night. beyond there, around the corner. So it's a fine line we, we, we're riding now between surprising him um, completely by going in so quietly or coming in too brash. So we want to just sort of find that middle ground between. Now, if he's not there now, we'll leave, and then we'll come back again a little bit later, do another big loop, and maybe try it just before dark. quiet. I do want him to get used to the sound of a person's voice, but I think he's got bigger problems <laughs> than us. Literally bigger problems than us for the second time today. Could be another reason why he's so unrelaxed. He's had multiple elephant herds through where he's feeding. Oh, look at that little one playing. He's just charged off there. Now, he probably just lay flat where that carcass is. The elephants might have smelt it, but just decided to move on past. Well, it looks like these elephants were a little bit further away from where he was earlier. So 
Ellie's actually moving off into Torchwood, not hanging about. There they go. Well, we'll come back and have a look at them if we have no luck a little bit further on. Staying quite far away. There he is. So we're gonna stay, we're gonna stay at this distance. We're not gonna push our luck any further. And he is lying. Of course, not the best visual, but this is the type of work it takes to habituate these cats. And maybe in about half an hour we may be able to move a little bit closer. Just trying to get it a shot of his face for ID purposes, but it is proving quite difficult. Also just trying to ascertain how old he is. Very difficult to see through the bush. Maybe he's a bit older. I'm not sure it's so difficult to see. We really haven't had the best visuals of him. Often with these type of situations, patience is by far the best. So, as nice as it would be to be 10 meters closer, I think where we are now is definitely at his comfort zone. So he's happy with us. He's not trying to run away. He's not showing any obvious body language, signs of body language that he's uncomfortable. So we're gonna call it, what do you, how much do you think that is? 50 meters? Have you? About 50 meters, and that's what he's comfortable at, with at the moment. So we're going to just sit here at about 50 meters for a while. And sometimes they can calm down quite quickly. Other times it does take a little bit. You, know, you can even see his beautiful little white tip to the tail there. And you can see the flies that irritate him quite a bit. Oh, sorry. It's also very, very important with animals like this not to push them too early. If you do, he'll never be relaxed. And this is one of those things that comes with a long time in the bush getting to know where you can stop, where you can't, how far you can push this time, and next time maybe we can go 10 meters closer. Even maybe in half an hour we can go 10 meters closer. And it's all about reading the situation, and these situations can be completely different from day to day. Now, have a look at that. He's not lying directly facing us anymore, so that's also a good sign. But he definitely sort of far enough away that he is comfortable now. With us this morning, we're pro or this early on the sunset drive, we're probably 10 meters closer than we were now, and he moved off. I'm not seeing an obvious dewlap, are you? Liam? So that wouldn't put him as sort of over six, but probably under six, but said it's quite difficult to see through that grass at the moment. No, then when you saw you shake his leg, the neck, there's no obvious dewlap there. So Errol, whose first safari this is, and is asking why is the leopard breathing so hard? Errol, he's got a belly full of kudu, it's very hot. And one of the hardest things for a leopard is the dissipation of heat. So what he's trying to do there is just pass down. What have you seen, Vim? Oh, that's probably mom.
So, sorry, Errol. So he's got a kill. He's got lots of meat in his belly, and he breathes hard and pants to get rid of some of that heat. And it's the best way for the big cats. You'll notice lions and leopards do it, even cheetah. Uh, panting is like a dog is their form of cooling down. So he's hot and he's got a big belly and, and digesting. All that meat does cause heat, uh, that whole process. So that's what he's doing, busy getting rid of his excess heat. He seems to have relaxed down quite nicely. And I'm slowly started raising uh, my voice. speaking louder and louder. He does look back over his shoulder every now and then. Look at that. He's definitely aware we're here. This is really exciting, guys. It's that it's a male from the tracks. Um, I did see some a little bit earlier, but unfortunately, we're not going to be able to move just yet. I want him to get nice and relaxed. Unless there's one close by here. Um, not that I can see just now. Oh, that's how we found him this morning, eh, Sule? Is um, we tracked him on foot. So we found where he dragged a baby kudu across the road and we walked in but before we found the kudu and I think that could be mom still hanging around the area where the baby was taken Aaron's wondering, will we give this guy a name if he sticks around? Um, most definitely. I think Vim and I have already got our vote in for a name. Um, Ghost or Spogel, <laughs> something like that. But it seems like, like most ghost stories, we're busy uncracking the mysteries at the moment. Uh, we found what distance he's comfortable at, and uh, if we go any further, I still think he'll move off again. So it's just really wonderful to be able to Look at him, there's a beautiful little golden light coming through on his chops. Now, if we come out a bit for him. So the kill is there, under that thicket right there. So apparently there's already a leopard in the Sabi Skans called Spogo. Um, and he's the son of the white cloth female from Mala Mala, but apparently he's further south these days. So, I don't know, we'll just go with ghost then, Liam. <laughs> it's unlikely he's gonna hang around if he is around four or five years old. I think Mr. Tingana might chase him. But fortunately for him, Mr. Tingana is near the, the boundary. This 
So, Joan, hi, Joan, who's in Washington, would like to know how long have I worked at habituating animals? Oof, a long time, Joan. So I was lucky enough when I was younger, I was present during the habituation of lions and leopards, or leopards in particular in Zululand, at a place called Pinda. And then in northern Botswana, we went and took over a hunting area and started photographic safaris there. So a lot of the cats were quite skittish. Uh, I think the biggest challenge then after that I faced has possibly been in Zambia and in Tanzania, in areas where they hadn't even seen vehicles, let alone people, for years and years and years. So he's obviously had some contact with people. In some of the areas I've worked, this is even way too close to a leopard. You can see he's actually quite far away, and they run at even the slightest noise. But at night, it's, it's generally easier. But I said, probably the best way I've found is if you find a drag mark and you find a kill. I'd often come just leave an empty vehicle with an old BBC news radio playing. So there's just constant talking, and at night, the animal would come relax. We'd probably leave it about this distance, actually. And uh, slowly but surely, uh, you habituate them like that. The best is always to find a female with cubs, and you habituate the cubs, and then they habituate their mom. Uh, cubs are much easier. Uh, older leopards, once they get older, they are quite already nervous animals. They rely on camouflage. So anything they're slightly unsure of, like us, uh, when it's an adult, it's better in their mind for them to just get out of dodge, so to speak. But I'm sure this guy must have had some, maybe not a lot. And some leopards are just more relaxed than others. You can have a leopard that was born to a Saibi Sands female and viewed from when it was two months old and reaches adulthood and just decides it doesn't like cars and runs away from them. You can see his general body language now is a lot more relaxed than we first arrived. And even though I am talking quite a bit louder than I was, he doesn't seem too perturbed. More irritated by the flies than anything else. So sometimes these things are just, it's a very slow, gradual process, and you don't want to rush it. So a cat in Tampa is wondering how far away is Tingana from the ghost. Well, Tingana's right at the access gate, uh, all the last tracks of him. So is the crow flies, what do you think, them? Three k's, three and a half kilometers? Somewhere around there. Look, he's gonna get up. Maybe he's moving back towards the kill. You can see a far more calm walk than the one we had earlier. Now, this is probably one of the most important points now. He's just popping his head over to see if we're doing anything, and that's what I'm talking about. To not start the car, to not move now. Um, even if he lies down where we can't see him, which he's going to, just... So really, there we go, his tail's still there. He's just, he's laid down in that thicket there. I can just see his tail flicking. You see that, Vim? Mm -hmm. And this is very important that we don't move the car now. Don't start the car. Don't go any closer. Don't put any more pressure. So I'm hoping he will move back to where that carcass is. Uh, he's probably just moved like any other leopard would move to get away from the flies. And I don't think, judging from that behavior, the way he walked, it was anything to do with us. So we're going to sit here, and this is really important now that we don't start the car and don't move, just not give him any negative connotations with movement. So uh, if you start moving every time a, a nervous leopard moves, he all he immediately associates that with something troublesome. Um, but he's still there. I can just see his tail flick every now and then. So we're going to sit here for a bit longer. But isn't this a, a wonderful sunset safari where we can go from one big cat to another? safari at all. You've arrived just at the right time. <laughs> He's too showing a little bit of bonding. 
between lionesses. And in fact, I think you've arrived... Never mind. I was about to say, I think you've arrived at the perfect time for them to get up and start moving. Oh, there we go. That's what I thought was going to happen. Both of them demonstrating a little bit of restlessness. Her reason is fairly apparent for that desire to get up. At least showing more motivation than the Styx female that we saw a couple of days ago. In that she did at least move in order to perform bodily functions. Nevertheless, she was showing lots of signs of yawning, licking her paws, and then licking the other female. And that almost always precedes a movement from the lionesses or lions. Bless you, girl. And I think here we go. Oh, I'm so glad we arrived when we did. They're hungry lionesses, and they're going to be on the move. Two Nkuhuma females missing the other three, and probably at some point tonight aiming to reunite with the rest of them. We did get a report that at least some of the Nkuhumas were on Manuleti, so the property to the north of Buffles Hook, which is to the north of our boundary. I'm sorry, just bear with me one moment. Ephraim's trying to get hold of me. Go ahead, Ephraim. It's just me at the moment. It looks like they're going to get mobile north. That's affirmative, but I'll keep you updated if this Mufazi lies down again. Okay, copy. All right, I'm going to take a gamble here and say before this lioness, and you can see how she's washing her paws, how she's yawning. I'm going to take a gamble and say that she's about to get up as well. And then I'm going to aim to get ahead of her by looping around on this game path that we followed, yes, all this morning to try and get around to the other side. I just have to do some dodging of some trees. I'm fairly certain she's going to move. Oh, sorry, Dave. Have a silver cluster leaf. Cool. Everybody watch your heads. I want to see which way she decides to go. Hello, girl. Now that is one intimidating stare. Debra, our armchair traveller, it's an absolute pleasure. Debra's just saying that she's had a wonderful sunset safari and would like to thank everyone at Wild Earth. Speaking for everyone at Wild Earth, it is always a pleasure to have you on board and enjoy these really wonderful experiences. There's nothing we enjoy more than bringing you these moments. And yes, absolutely, a new leopard, elephants, and now lionesses on the move. She is staring off intently to the west. I wonder what she's heard. I think she heard a voice saying, lie down again. <laughs> That's apparently what she heard. Here comes the second lioness to join her. I can't reposition right now just because I don't want to startle her. Okay, she's all right. They're still yawning. 
still showing signs of restlessness, so they are going to keep moving. I don't think this is a very long stop. There is a chance we could lose them in this block. Which way is the wind blowing, Dave? That's going to be very important in about two seconds. Once they get a move out of our view, it's going to be very tricky to follow them. We are going to, however. It's just going to involve a bit of looping around. And while we do that, let's head back over to Brent. So, guys, we're still sitting. We haven't moved an inch as not to scared that guy off. I have seen his tail flick a few times. And what you do is we're gonna maybe it is getting dark. The kid is still on the ground. So I'm just gonna drive very slowly past. Uh, and then if we do get one last glimpse, wonderful. Other than that I'm gonna zone this area so no one else comes here. Especially with him being skittish and especially with that kill on the ground. Very important, let the car run. Don't move straight away. Now, he definitely heard that. He's definitely probably watching us. So we want to keep all our movements very, very fluid, very slow. Just, even if I do see him, I'm not going to stop. I'm just going to carry on past. Okay, I can see him, but we're not going to stop. He's, he's crouched down a little bit low. Actually, he's looking okay. Now, again, it's all reading every situation slightly differently. It is a bit darker. He might be a little bit more relaxed now. You got him, Vim. Mm -hmm. Forward, rather. A little bit more. Yep. Rolling. Okay, maybe we can get a get a screenshot of his face now. We're a little bit closer. It could be the darkness. It could be the fact that we've just sat there quietly. We haven't put pressure. We haven't had tried to off-road up to him. And he is looking a lot more relaxed. Look at that, he's lying flat. This is incredible. And a little bit of patience pays off so much with an animal like this. And Vicky says, this is amazing being able to watch the habituation of a new leopard. Thank you very much for including us. Well, Vicky, it's my pleasure. And it's nice to actually see animals that aren't relaxed because a lot of people often is, assume that you just drive around and the leopards sort of lie next to the road and they're very easy to find. Uh, but there has been a lot of work beforehand to get them to that stage. So we now probably 40 meters, maybe even a little bit less from him. The 
fact that he's lying down with his head on the ground and he's not constantly staring at us is a huge, huge positive. But we're still going to sit here for a little bit longer while we can before it gets dark. But Jamie's got some lions on the way straight towards her. just walked right past the vehicle and on their way down the road. Walking straight into the sunset. One of them with a slight limp at the back. Can't quite work out exactly where she's limping from. Oh, some fragments just got her serious right. is this too beautiful for words now once they get a little bit further ahead we'll be able to loop around them and just go across to the front I just want to give somebody else a chance to view this incredible sight of their tails swinging in harmony beautiful all right let's go back over to Brent Well, I know it's not the best visual of a leopard, but it is a, for me, it's an absolutely fantastic visual. The fact that he's laid down flat, he's not nearly as perturbed with our presence as he was a bit earlier. And while we've been sitting here, I've been slowly speaking a little bit louder and a little bit louder just to get him used to the sound of a human voice and realize. There's no threat. You can see he's more concerned with the biting flies. There you go, he popped his head up for a second there just to check where we were. And then popped his head down. It's still difficult for me to give an exact age. I mean, I haven't seen him nice and out in the open, but I'm still sticking with my, I'd say he's between four and five. You can see him battling with those flies there. So Mary Ann has put a very great point in here. Would I collect his scat for the Panthera project? on leopard lineages, most definitely, Marianne. And I actually plan to come, oh, look at that. I plan to come back um, once he's moved off and finished that carcass, because I'm sure there will be some scat close by, and definitely collect that scat. And I will hand that in. Let me just... Let's try and move forward a little bit. Oh, look at that, chasing the flies. But while we stay with this leopard, Jamie's lions are on the stalk. Okay, so things have changed completely. The lioness is going into stalk mode. Look at what they've spotted. An impala herd completely unaware of their presence. Distracted by the rutting, they're chasing each other around. But they haven't realized. Oh, yeah, in fact, they're running towards the lines. You can see them dashing about. They're 
distracted. Look at this coordination. Now the lioness in the front is probably going to initiate the chase. Stay here. And now it becomes a question of patience and a waiting game. We're going to stay exactly where we are. We've got a perfect view. Only when they set off will we move. see the Impala anymore. I'm not sure where they've moved to. But for now it seems that the lioness are content to wait a little bit for their chance. There's the Impala springing in the back. go back for our last few moments with that wonderful leopard and we'll be back with these lines if anything changes. So we're going to have one last look at this guy just before dark and he's lying down so flat we can barely see him. You can just see those rosettes. There he is. So one last look. We'll definitely come check in this area first thing tomorrow morning but Hopefully he hasn't lost his carcass, so he's decided to put it in a tree. So we're going to leave him be and see what other wonders are out there while we do that. Let's go back to Jamie and the lions. Here we go. The lions carefully watching the impala stall. There's another vehicle coming to join the sighting. We are still going to stay exactly where we are. Happy with our position for now. Impala is still completely unaware at the back. I can see the flashes of white as their tails twitch. and leopards demonstrate one of their strongest qualities, which is patience. The wind for them at the moment is perfect. And the Impala, look at them, they're so distracted at the back there. The young ram starting to rut. All you can see is flashes of white. I know that the sun is starting to go down. Unfortunately, we can't move any closer or we can't illuminate any further. Oh, yes, we can. Got one more. Perfect. Thank you, Dave. Now, most of our regular viewers will know this, but for new viewers, when we have a hunt like this as it starts to get dark, we do not shine on the lion's and that's for a couple of reasons. One, it could illuminate them so that the prey spots them. Two, it could be distracting for both. And three, it could actually accidentally act to detract from the night vision of the impala or whatever they happen to be hunting. Now, the brief flashes that you are seeing from the guest's cameras, I know that you can see them illuminating them, for now will not, not make any kind of a difference. 
but once it does start to get completely dark, you'll notice that none of us will shine lights on these hunting lionesses. They seem to have settled for now. I don't think that they're going to go rushing off on any mad pursuits just yet. that these lionesses have been or have got active as soon as they have it has been another blisteringly hot afternoon surprisingly so for this time in March but at least the bush now is starting to carry that proper African scent of a summer's night that I've been missing over the last few months since we have so lacked in rain. The sun has now set and I believe that the lionesses are going to wait until it is completely dark before they make their move. As you know, lionesses or lions in general are ambush predators. And they want to conduct the hunt when it's a bit cooler and without having to chase for enormous distances if they can help it. They don't have much in the way of stamina. Impala can outrun them, and they have great, they can continue to run for longer than the lionesses can. They're almost hamstrung by their bulk and by their strength. But you can hear the happy scrub robin singing away. And the odd crested Franklin there is a certain incredible silence that descends as night falls. going to be their game. They are going to wait until it is completely dark. Now Snoop, just as I was talking about the fact that it is going to get darker and that the lionesses are waiting for it to get dark. You're wondering about why lionesses only succeed 20% of the time. And the answer to that is because of that ambush situation that I spoke of. Just by the way, they have no long, they're no longer actually actively hunting. So the presence of the vehicles is not doing any damage to their hunting capacity. They are going to wait it out until it's a little bit darker. But Snoop, that's one of the reasons why, is that these they are more built for short-based sprints. Pretty much every animal, every prey species here is capable of outrunning a lion and has greater stamina. But lions will give up as soon as they realize that they've been spotted too soon for the chase to be successful. They will actively give up on the chase rather than waste the energy and risk the overheating that they could be exposed to.
And as you can see, the lions are now resting completely, so they're not going to go dashing off after the impala. As soon as they do show any signs of stalking, then those lights will go off. That is such a beautiful image. <laughs> and speaking about the and Google my line and says, oh, there's the wind. They need that wind. Isn't this image incredible, though? Look at them looking up at the moths above their head. James has said, hopefully the Nkuhuma that runs like a cheetah is here. <laughs> That's a wonderful comparison. That was with James a couple of mornings ago when the Nkuhumas were hunting wildebeest. And we just hear James shouting, she's running like a cheetah, look at her, she's running like a cheetah. It was such an incredible, exciting, and he was so excited and I could see exactly what he meant. She was stretching out full, the sort of full length of her body. Oh, yawning again. Might be time to be up and about. see the spider webs blowing in the wind as well. So I said that this is the kind of wind that they want. I mean that the, the noise of the wind, as well as it's blowing the scent of them away from the prey that they're hunting, will give them a tremendous advantage as they head out hunting. Another big yawn. They might be thinking of getting moving. Godfrey was wondering, on the subject of the sense of smell and the wind that is blowing, he was wondering if they can smell the impala. They might have been able to initially, oh, such big yawns. That's time to get up. Godfrey was wondering if the lions could smell the impala. Yes, they might have been able to initially. I don't think they can anymore, though. The, the wind has very much changed direction. But I think, quite honestly, Godfrey, that they saw them before anything else. Slowly inching forward in increments. Errol? It's an absolute pleasure. Errol is our, one of our new viewers and is just saying how much he's enjoying this website and that he cannot believe that he's only just found it. Well, Brent, I'm glad that you've jumped on board. I'm sure our regular viewers would be more than happy to, <laughs> or maybe they wouldn't know where to begin updating you on all that has transpired over the last few years. It's certainly taken me a few months to catch up with the history that has been recorded here. Another big yawn. She's going to get up next. Uh, depending on what she does, or what the lionesses do from this vantage point, that will determine whether or not, whether or not I decide to move forward in any way. If they get up and start walking casually down the middle of the road, then we will follow them. If they are up and starting to stalk slowly, then we will wait. So for now, I'm also, I'm right at the back behind two vehicles. So I'm not going to, just to show you where I am, I haven't taken my spotlight out. I'm not using it for now um, for a couple of different reasons. But at the moment, one spotlight is perfectly sufficient. So that will just determine how we approach the sighting from now is their, the actions and what they do next. At the moment, though, I think they're going to stay lying down for at least another few minutes. The wind has changed, and you can actually see, maybe you can see from the leaves blowing, 
that it's blowing the lion scent straight towards the impala. Sheehan, that's not a silly comment at all. Sheehan has said that she finds it amazing how similar the, their behavior is to house cats. Copy F, I'm gonna move back so you can come out. We're just gonna move backwards a little bit. Sorry, Sheehan. You were just talking about how similar their behavior is to that of domestic cats. silly at all. They can be very similar. Their, their body language can be incredibly similar to domestic cats. Just want to make sure everyone's not going to clip the side of our car. I'm just giving him a light on which to base his judgment. Thank you very much. No problem. Enjoy. In morning. Cheers, guys. In Enjoy. Bye-bye. But yes, they can be incredibly like domestic cats. Okay, we can go forward again. In the way that they move, the way that they clean themselves, the way that they yawn, all of those can be so similar to the body language that we associate from our domestic animals. dark but we are just gonna sit here and watch what's happening and watch what they decide to do but Marla's grandchild is watching for the very first time and you was just saying that she really hopes she could stomach a kill well don't worry we'll warn you if there's anything that's gonna like that that's gonna happen and you can decide if maybe you just want to turn away for a little while and then come back to watching when it's all over a lot of people just aren't very happy about watching kills. That's perfectly fine. They, they can be exceptionally difficult to watch. So just turning, there's no shame in just turning away. It's all part of nature and we do show it as part of bringing you a real reflection of life out here. But there's no, no shame in turning off the screen when you can't handle watching something die. Lala, apparently your granddaughter's name is Sarah. Well, welcome, Sarah. I hope you are really enjoying yourself. And I'm speaking nice and softly so that I don't disturb these lines when they decide what they're going to do if they're going to go out and hunt. The wind's still whistling through the trees and it's still blowing in complete. Sorry, I'm not quite sure who this is. Trying to listen to. Hold on one second. I think somebody was trying to call me, but it got a little bit distorted. Look at that beautiful sky. show any sign of moving have to wait this out it's an exercise in patience and tranquility I can't hear anything from the Impala I'm not 
even sure if they're still where that we last saw them or if they've moved off a little bit. The other possibility, of course, is that Tinkone could have come walking down the road. His tracks were just a little bit to the north of where we've seen them. I don't think so, though. I think he's going to continue west towards Simbambili. I could be completely wrong, though. But he was also... OK, she's up. Let's just see what she does. I can barely, barely see in this darkness. Here we go. She doesn't look like she's stalking. Squinting. Perhaps I should eat more carrots or whatever it is that gives you the power of, to see at night. <laughs> Very much struggling. She looks like, okay, she's, she is lying down in the middle of the road. I can't actually shine on them without shining in Taxon's guest. There they are. Okay, we're turning off, sorry. I know it's just gone completely black, but we're just only shining a little bit at the time. Oh. They have picked a main road to decide to operate their hunt on. And that is not, in fact, a game drive vehicle. Although the one <laughs> behind it might be. Oh, dear. Ladies, not a good place to decide to conduct your hunt. <laughs> the main access road. We're going to pull off the road completely. We're actually going to back up completely. I'll ask Taxon to keep us updated on the sighting. Let's just get out of everybody's way. Mm. This is going to be interesting, though. We have a standoff here between a non-game drive car on their way home in from the gate, which is not but 500 metres away, and some lioness. Hello. <laughs> All right, we're going to shift away. We're going to give everybody some space to get through. While we do, let's head over to Brent. Look at that elephant silhouette in the sunset. Well, the sun's already set, but just in the in that light, late afternoon glow. Isn't that gorgeous? And seeing how they melt away. There's this beautiful big herd all over quarantine. And VM and I are just sitting here in the dark, enjoying some time with them, the sounds. And there's that all around us, actually behind us and in front of us. You can't really see all of them, but if I pop my little side light on, there we go. You can see one there. Isn't this amazing? And this wind's picked up out of nowhere. And we have this Eddie's coming a bit closer to us. We are waiting for another one to move onto that sort of horizon so we can get that incredible silhouette again. But there's this wind that's picked up out of nowhere. There's not a cloud in the sky, but there's this really hot wind. And you can sort of see it on the tree there. But these elephants are still incredibly relaxed. Hey, little boy. What a fantastic evening so far. Lions, leopards, elephants, and obviously for me, the excitement of a new, new leopard. Maybe on the move. Off he goes. Being a proper little boy, you can just make out another one there. Turn the lights off. The silhouette in the sunset. Now, we were hoping that they were going to walk a little bit further through the sunset. There we go, just like that. 
Isn't it great when a plan comes together? Absolutely majestic. Now, moving through towards a bush, is it going to stop to feed or is it going to walk into that really big open area that we were planning for? No, I'm going to stop for a feed. We are incredibly lucky to live in a place like this, surrounded by Africa's great beasties. You can see the wind. See the wind howling through those trees on quarantine. There we go, Vim. Perfect timing. That's the one we were looking for, moving out through that slightly more open patch. And with everything out in the bush, a little bit of patience really pays off. Absolutely exquisite. Now, we might get lucky if we move a little bit further to the north. As they move across quarantine, we might catch them silhouetted under those big marula trees. Make sure there's no elephants still behind us. Nope, they've moved off. Last thing we want to do is give them a fright. I'm not going to turn my lights on. And I'm just going to try and get the last, last bit of this incredible silhouette before it gets too dark to see. Now, again, there's another really awesome sort of open area just past where they are now. So while we sit here quietly with the Ellies, let's go see what the lions are up to. I'm afraid we should actually move forward in the dark. We're gonna, I'm going to have to be in the dark. The lionesses are now moving down the road, very much in stalking mode. So they are hunting. Oh, we're going to go forward a little bit, just because they have gone very, very far ahead of us in the road. And I'm straining my eyes to see. Pardon? I'll let you know. I'm going to tell Dave when to switch our present light off. They're lying down again in the road. And we're just illuminating with a quick flash of light, or at least taxis ahead of me. Maybe watch that stunning sky as we do. I'm not sure if you can hear the wind gusting about me. And this is how lions hunt. 20 meters at a time. 
and then lie down for 15 minutes. And then maybe another 10, maybe another 20 meters, and then lie down again. Slow and steady and very, very careful is their approach. tell you anything more about where they are or if they moved. It's now too dark even for my eyes to pick out the vaguest of their shapes. The other vehicle, the poor other vehicle that decided that they wanted to get home from Gauri Gate has had to relocate themselves and go in a different direction. So for now it's just us and the night sounds and that cricket that is somewhere to the left of us. This is where the night starts to play tricks on you start imagining all kinds of sights and sounds while you sit and you wait in complete darkness. It's a very strange sensation. I mean, I think what I'm looking at is a lion. It might also be a tree, for all I know. <clears throat> it is just a darker shade of black on black. Right, I promise to keep you updated. Let's find out what's happening on Brent's side. So we're still sitting with these Ellies and I'm just gonna show you quickly. They're right next to us. We've just oh it's the guy with the floppy ear. Hello, mister. So we don't, sometimes Ellie's don't like lights. And we, Vim and I have just really been sitting in the dark, just listening to them. It is a really special thing. You hear them as they move through. Let me kill this completely. And they were making some wonderful rumblings. And of course they've gone quiet now. A few of them still here, all around us. We just see them disappearing off into the darkness. Now, uh, as I said, we're not going to put any light directly on them. And you can see the wind is gusting away, which is good if you're in Nkahuma. Good hunting weather. Make things a little bit easier to catch. But I don't think these eddies... Here we go, we're going to try and show you one there. I'm going to be up to too much. So I think we're going to move on and see if we can find anything else out on the edge of quarantine. There's my big spotlight. There it is. That's a bigger bull. Hello, mister. 
make sure it's not a naughty elephant. No, I don't think it's the naughty elephant. Oh. No, not naughty elephant. Oh, another elephant. Well, everywhere we look is elephants. Well, at least there's a scrub here as well. You can see, even though he's not facing us, his ears, watch how they pivot and move to catch any potential sound around him. And then you can see his fluffy white tail just popping out. Goodbye, Mr. Scrub Hair. and civets around, or maybe the serval that you, Jamie and VM found the other night. Anything is possible out here in the African bush. Switzerland is wondering if I've noticed that some of the birds have left or migrated north. Yes, Heidi, I mean, the barn swallows are gone. I haven't seen a European roller in a day or two. So I think quite a few of them are left. There's the odd woodlands kingfisher still around, and the European bees are still around. But a lot of the others have already departed. Now, we have those, oh, more Ellie's. Lots of elephants everywhere today. So those birds that migrate through to Europe. Now, during the winter months, we get some seasonal migrants from the Drakensberg Mountains that we look off in the distance. So you'll get some of the birds, as it gets really cold up in the mountains, will migrate down to the Lofeld. Of course, not that far, and they're not long-distance migrants, just seasonal migrants. Uh, and, sorry, the correct term is altitudinal migrants is what I'm looking for. And uh, so we do get a few species, not too many in the Sabi sands, generally a bit closer to the mountains and to the middle felt, as they call it. Certain robin species, and that will actually move down from the, the higher areas where it gets very cold. Deborah, the armchair traveler, says, isn't it amazing how you can sit in the dark and be surrounded by such massive animals and only see them when you turn the lights on and how something so big can be so stealthy? It is incredible. It's one of the things I like about them. And they can be so quiet, or they can be the noisiest animal in the bush with trumpets, screams, roars, rumbles, all sorts of fanfare.
thank you, Valeria, for such a wonderful comment. Uh, Valeria, Valeria says, thank you, Brent and Jamie. You're so respectful of the animals, and we love it. Well, thank you for watching, Valeria, and thank you for your support. There's a car coming. I was going to find a spot to just pull over for them. I oh, know they're going. I think where I was planning on going, but anyway, uh, I think they're heading home towards the western edge. I'm going in search of that serval that was seen a few nights ago. I think that's Aubrey on his way home. VM says it was around here, so we come, we've come to have a look. You never know. It's, I've seen several in this exact spot as well, or a little bit further up the road. And hopefully in the dry season we will see a few more of such creatures. Who knows, maybe even the first caracal on a live safari. Okay, so now we're heading into the open area where that serval was last seen. Let's slow it up a little bit and have a look. of rodents, one of their favorite favorite foods. They also are great hunters of birds. And uh, it is incredible if you ever get to see a serval stalk after a rodent, they, in the long grass, they literally leap, jump, leap, jump. Very, very incredible. Wonderful animals. It was here, have you? John Crawford, who's a new viewer. Lovely to have such a bunch of new viewers on board with us over this weekend and into this week. Uh, John would like to know, how does one become a safari guide? Uh, well, John, lots of different ways and means, and uh, you can either do an apprenticeship at a safari lodge, and then they might take you on their training course. There are training courses that you can pay for, and then you do placements or work experience and then depending sometimes the work experience will take you on afterwards other times not um, it depends there's lots of different types of safari guiding i mean from what we do uh, through to driving uh, a large vehicle through kruger with lots of people on the back so it all depends on on where and what you want to do and I suggest if you have a look online, uh, you'll have a look. There's lots of different game ranges courses or safari guide courses available. And uh, some are better than others. And all, on all of them, you will learn. But uh, my personal recommendation is if you can offer yourself as an apprentice to a lodge um, and you get taught by the guys on the job, so to speak. And that generally is a is the best way and certain of the large lodges in the Savi Sands will take on uh, I think twice a year training courses and uh, if you pass the training course you get a job and if you don't 
it's that's that and you can start with very little sort of wildlife knowledge and they will teach you that as they go along but one must remember the most important thing about a safari guide is that you are an entertainer you're a host to people from all around the world and of course it's really important to know all the little facts and stuff about the bushes and the trees and the insects and the lions and the leopards but it's the trick is delivering them in an entertaining way and uh, that's why often a lot of scientists don't make good safari guides as my dad says it's far more of an art than a than a science as i've been on some trips with some incredibly knowledgeable guys but they were inc incredibly bad at reading the crowd so to speak and one of the guys was quite funny and then also you get your very sort of uh i'm not gonna uh, yeah but uh, i went on a safari once when i was uh, assessing uh, for the owner of the lodge and uh, the guide took me up to a tree like this actually it was an, actually an elephant so it wasn't a tree let's see if we can find an elephant and uh, the elephant was doing some really interesting behavior it was digging out uh, quite a big tuba in, in in the very dry northwestern part of the country but that guy had a list of facts and he was going to tell me them whether i wanted to know them or not and not uh, not if i wanted to know what tuba he was digging so he goes there be an elephant he weighs six ton da -da -da, da -da -da, da -da -da. so there's lots of different things and lots of different types of safari guides So it's been a fantastic sunset safari with a brand new leopard, but let's spend the last few moments with some lions. So from VM and myself on the rust bucket, bonne nuit. <laughs> that light is very bright. <laughs> so we, I just wanted to give you a quick heads up as to what's happening. The lionesses are still lying down in the middle of the road. They are still interested in the impala, but it's going to be a very long, very slow process. So we're not gonna keep trying to sort of stay with them as it happens. It's not like a quick ambush hunt or chasing a buffalo herd. It's very, very different trying to stalk the ever alert, ever constantly alert impala. So we are going to end the show on time. I'm going to leave the lionesses to their hunt. We have just every now and again had a flash of light from another vehicle, so they are still there. They're just very slowly making their approach, and it could last a long, very long time. Right, thank you very much, Dave, for all of your fantastic camera work. We've had an incredible afternoon. A herd of elephants, elephants on quarantine, and then that mystery lion, I mean, mystery leopard, and now the lioness is on the hunt. Hopefully, fingers crossed for tomorrow morning, Sunrise Safari will be able to come back and see if these two have had any luck while they've been hunting. This wind is a good thing, plus the fact that the moon hasn't risen is going to give them plenty of opportunity to go about their daily business. Thank you as well to Louise and Jerry in Final Control, who do a wonderful job of directing us, as well as to our brilliant technical department. Have a wonderful day wherever you are in the world, and we will catch up with you on the Sunrise Safari. Thank you for joining, and bye-bye. <laughs>